jump in. Wanted to read Psalm 28. Well, it's good to start off with a bit of the Bible, especially in this class where we're talking about our faith in God. To you, O Lord, I call my rock. Be not deaf to me, lest if you be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help, when I lift up my hands toward your most holy sanctuary. Do not drag me off with the wicked, with the workers of evil, who speak peace with their neighbors while evil is in their hearts. Give to them according to their work and according to the evil of their deeds. Give to them according to the work of their hands. Render them their due reward, because they do not regard the works of the Lord or the work of his hands. He will tear them down and build them up no more. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exults and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. O oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Now this last line jumped out at me today. I was reading it in my other classes. And, uh, you know, we read a psalm a day keeps the devil away. And uh, but this last line jumped out at me because David's talking to God and he is asking God to be the shepherd of his people. Now, the Jews, of course, just believed in one God, right? That's kind of the essence of Judaism, is that there's only one God. And um, so he's calling God, the great shepherd of Israel. But that reminded me of something else. Where else? There's a very famous shepherd passage in the New Testament. Who else claims to be a shepherd? <laughs> in the New Testament. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Jesus is always the answer in a Bible class unless it's not. But yeah, Jesus claims to, Jesus says he is the great shepherd, uh, or I'm the good shepherd, sorry, good shepherd. And so I thought to myself, hmm, coincidence? I think not. Um, so Jesus is picking up on this, this Old Testament image um, that God is the shepherd of Israel. And I think this might be um another one of jesus's ways that he's identifying with god the father so basically this is another example where jesus is claiming to be god and this reminded me of something else i wrote on my blog once upon a time on the soder blog i will give you a link so you can read more about it but he's also picking up something isn't that a nice picture? I didn't take it, but isn't it nice? Beautiful. Cute little sheep on the mountain. But um, yeah, Jesus is picking up also on Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 34. And I think Jesus is referencing Ezekiel, but I'm not going to read it right now. You can read it later on your own. So anyway, there's this theme. And so when you're talking to your friend, atheist, atheist Bob, you can tell your friend about how Jesus is fulfilling all these Old Testament images. How he's claiming to be God the Father. All right, I can't keep up with the private messages, guys. Um, so the best way, if you want me to actually answer a question, is to use your microphone. The chat, the chat is just too too chatty. I can't keep up. Let's open the prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for uh, this day. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that you are the good shepherd. Um, thank you that you sent your son into our world um, to, to live and to, as, as the true man, as the ultimate man, and to die for our sins. Please bless our discussion. May I glorify you. Please draw us closer to you. Please increase our faith. And we pray all this in Jesus' name through the Spirit. Amen. All right, so principles of war. 
Principles of War. Let's jump right in. You're supposed to read chapters one through four. And um, yeah, I told you a little bit about Jim Wilson and his life. I think you were all here last time. Um, I need to give you a link to Jim Wilson's testimony. Remind me that I'll, I'll have some more information on Jim Wilson for you next time. But Jim Wilson has his testimony um, out there online. And it talks about his life and how he became a Christian. And uh, it's just good to read that. So um, Jim Wilson went to the Naval Academy. Uh, and so then uh, was uh, a Navy officer at the end of World War II and then mostly during the Korean War. And so he was a lifelong student of the Bible and also a student of, um, of military history. And so he combines this uh, lifelong experience with being an evangelist and being a very successful evangelist. Um, he, like I said, influenced thousands of people all over the world and um, God used him to bring thousands of people to himself. So he, he was a very effective evangelist. I remember one of his sons. So he has, um, he had four kids. Um, one of his sons uh, was telling me, Doug Wilson's brother was telling me how when they were kids, uh, Jim Wilson would, would always pick up, you know, people who were hitchhiking um, but then he would always give them a Bible. Um, and you, you had to be careful because they said they would, that Jim Wilson would give away the kids' Bibles. If they weren't careful, he was just always giving away everyone's Bibles. So <laughs> he had to, had to protect their Bible. Um, but it went to a good cause. It went to a good cause. So, yes. Let's jump right in. Objective. Let's see, actually, you know what? Actually, let's talk about the preface. I hope you all have the preface. Let's look at the preface. So he says we are doing some things wrong. Oh, he didn't read the preface? <gasps> oh no. Well, he says we are doing some things wrong with evangelism. He says we are just still teach, trying to get people to volunteer instead of teaching them to obey. Um, so he's saying we need to teach people how to evangelize, uh, not just as an option, but as a way of life. And um, so he's trying to help us do that in this book to give us all ways to think about evangelism so that we can just do this as part of our, our daily lives. So chapter one, objective, objective. What is the objective? In chapter one, in Christian evangelism, who is the general and what is the objective? You can answer either one of those. So those are two questions for everybody. Yeah, Ethan. Uh, the general is Jesus Christ. That's right. So we are serving General Jesus. Yes, he is the supreme commander, the, com the commander in chief. So yeah, so what's, what's the objective? Sophia. Probably help if I unmuted myself and didn't turn my camera off. That won't help. Um, Okay, so the objective is to basically, I think he was saying that Jesus has defeated um, everyone. So he like had a concise victory, basically like using the general terms. And we need to spread the news because there's captives who don't know yet. So our objective is to tell everyone about what Jesus did and salvation. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Our objective is 
the world. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, we have a big, a big objective here. And this is based on what Jesus said. At the end of Matthew, we, we call this the Great Commission. So before Jesus ascends back into heaven, isn't this interesting? Let's just pause here for a minute. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Those blockheads, those disciples, they're so thick-headed. Even after he's, he rose from the dead, some are still, well, I'm not sure. I still need more evidence. So anyway, but Jesus says, and uh, he came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So how much authority was given to Jesus? All authority. Not just a little bit of authority. All authority. And not just all authority in heaven. All authority on, in heaven and on earth. And on earth. Has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So this is a really clear um, uh, evidence for the Trinity that Jesus wants us to baptize everyone in the name of the triune God, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So King Jesus is currently ruling over everything. He's not waiting up in heaven to come and set up his kingdom. He's already ruling over everything. I know this gets into eschatology, but let's just agree in principle, okay? So he is ruling in principle over everything. And so our job is to go tell everybody about it, right? Go tell it on the mountain. We all know that song. So yeah, that, that's our job. Go tell everybody. This is similar to, um, if you think back to World War II, what's the difference between D-Day and V-Day? D-Day and V-Day. This is similar, not exactly the same. But what happened in D-Day? D-Day, the invasion of Normandy, the Allied invasion. Yeah, Jaden. So I could be wrong here, but I believe D-Day stand for, stood for like Declaration Day or something like that. So basically declaring full out war on Germany and then the, and then the ice Axis powers. And then V-Day was like Victory Day, I believe. I could be wrong though. Yeah, I know V-Day is Victory Day, but now I'm actually not quite sure what D-Day actually, <laughs> what, what the code was for that. But it was the invasion of Normandy. So that's when the Allies, you know, decisively invaded and started the process of um, taking out the Nazis. So D-Day was the real turning point um, of, of the war. Um, but then V-Day was, was victory over, over, um, over the Axis powers. So in the same way, Jesus has decisively um, conquered sin, death, and the devil. The Bible talks about this. Um, Jesus has conquered the devil. He's overcome death. And now our job is to tell everybody about it. So D-Day has already happened. So now we're moving towards V-Day. We're moving towards um, the ultimate victory, the ultimate, um, the ultimate conquest of the powers of darkness. So our job, Jesus has won the battle, and our job is to tell everybody about it. Okay? So the battle has really already been won. Now we're just telling everybody that King Jesus reigns and King Jesus rules. All right, so, and, and uh, that's a different image than a lot of people have in their minds. 
for a lot of people, we kind of picture ourselves as at the end of, you know, the Lord of the Rings, where there's a small army marching against all the orcs, and they're all surrounded, and they're all going to die. Sometimes people picture the church that way. Well, here we are. We're all huddled together. Repent, orcs. Believe in Jesus. Uh, but really, uh, if you read the Bible, um, there's much more of a proclaiming the victory that has already come, has already been, um, been won. And Jim Wilson talks about this on page 17. Let's look at page 17. I'm assuming we all have the same book. Anyway, it's at the very end of the first chapter. The church has been, has been counting on the victory promised in the second coming, rather than seeking the victory commanded and mandated in Matthew 28, before the end of the age. This is a cop-out from the present responsibility. So he's saying many Christians are just looking forward to Jesus coming again to fix all the problems. But he's saying that's a cop-out. We have a job to do right now. Yes, Jesus is going to come again. Yes, he's going to decisively conquer all of, his, all of his enemies. But we have a job to do right now. And we need to have more of a sense of urgency and um, commitment to this, to this job that we have. So Jim Wilson is great in just getting us to focus on the, the job of evangelism that we all should be pursuing however we can. So offensive, let's talk about how to be offensive. Oh, no, 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 how to take the offense, how to go on the offense. So let's talk about this from a military term. In warfare, what do we mean by offensive? What does offensive mean in military terms? It's okay to just quote from the book, totally fine. Yes, Maria. Um, okay, so I'll just quote the book. It's like the first sentence. In warfare, the offensive is the means by which one takes the objective. It is an aggressive advance against an enemy to wrest the objective from his possession. So it's basically, what I thought about it is like, I don't know why, but I was like, I'm getting robbed and like the guy with the knife is, is the offensive. I don't know. That's how I thought about it. <laughs> Right. So you don't just, you know, sit back and say, take it. You go on the offensive, right? You use all of your, your uh, ninja skills. You go on the offensive to get back your purse. So, yeah, in military terms, um, offensive is how we go get the objective. Now, he also notes here, the offensive is an attitude as well as an action. This is important because as Christians, do you think we have more of a defensive attitude or an offensive attitude? Generally speaking to Christians today, do we, are we more on the defense or are we more on the offense in our attitude, the way we think about things? And don't forget, this is your last day to participate for your participation grade. Um, Aiden, yes. Oh, sweet. Let's go. I get a talk. Okay. Um, so I think definitely uh, defensive nowadays, because instead of like the way I see offensive for Christian, would just be like, go, go, go. We got to spread the gospel. We got to spread the good news. Every single person I meet in the grocery store waiting in line, they need to hear about Jesus Christ. Instead, it's it seems a lot more uh low-key just kind of keep to yourself uh and you feel like all these atheists are almost like they're against you you don't really want to go out there it's kind of dangerous and scary so we just kind of want to stay in and be defensive about it yeah good 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 i will always call on you um if if you if you haven't spoken maybe as much recently i always try and let people you know have a chance to participate um, Stephen, yes. I really do agree with him on that. Um, I feel like Christians are really becoming more conserved with um, everything and believe in because um, our culture kind of like shun, uh, shuns a lot of uh, um, 
Christian ideas. I mean, you know, if you say that you're against homosexuality, you're going to get shunned for that. So I think our culture, you know, as Christians, we are really just, uh, um, you know, being ashamed of our beliefs, basically. And we don't really tell everyone. Yeah, the bird needs to be quiet. I agree. Always knows when I'm about to talk and then always just starts interrupting. Hate him. <laughs> oh, birds these days. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I love that image, Aiden, of, of you telling everyone in the grocery store about Jesus. Uh, we have someone in, in, in our community. Um, um, he was born with um, uh, some brain damage um, that affected him. But he, he's a sweet, sweet guy. And um, he just tells everyone about Jesus. He has no inhibitions. He's just the sweetest guy. He'll walk up to random strangers and just, do you know Jesus? Do you have hope of, of eternal life? He's just wonderful. So I think we could be more like that sometimes. But um, <laughs> uh, okay, Hannah, I guess I'll let you talk. <laughs> yeah, so adding on to what's been already said, I feel like Christians aren't as offensive because they're afraid of what the world will think of them and they don't want to like rise a fight because sometimes if this happened with my with my mom she got into a disagreement with someone and they got into a fight and weren't friends anymore and so I think like fear of that and just what the response will be keeps them from being offensive yeah that's that's a very real um a real possibility but remember what Jesus said. He actually said, I did not come to bring, to bring peace, but a sword. And that he will actually create division with, even within families. So, yeah. Uh, okay, Jaden. I feel like another thing is some people will say like, well, I haven't been called to be a missionary. Let the missionaries do all the saving. Those who have been called to it. And I'll help provide for them, but it's not my job to go out and share the gospel. Yeah, that's uh, <clears throat> yeah. I struggle with that too. Like you know, I I don't have the same gifting. Well, so some people definitely have gifts. You know, I think Jim Wilson had the gift of evangelism. I think the Bible does talk about the gift of evangelism. We 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 do have different gifts, but we all have a responsibility. And I think everyone can do more than, the, than we're currently doing. So some people might be gifted, but um, we all have the responsibility. Yeah, Joe. Yeah, I, I, can you hear me? Yep. All right, thank you. Um, I think that we're, I agree with everybody has spoken. You know, I think that we're definitely not on the offensive anymore, but I, <laughs> I don't even know if we're on the defensive anymore. Just looking around at the churches, you know, we're, I think that one of uh, the devil's main uh, attacks against us right now is trying to get us to be friends with them, you know, trying to uh, uh, make us and the world peaceful together and dwell together. Um, so, yeah, I don't even know if we're being <laughs> defensive or offensive at this moment right here. So. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's a good question to ask ourselves. Maybe we've just given up sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, Esther. Um, tying this into Lewis a little bit when he was talking about, we were talking about why it's so important to take apologetics. And I think too, the reason why people aren't offensive is because they don't know their beliefs. And so they're afraid of being asked questions that they won't know the answers to. Um, I know I've been there. So I think that's something we struggle with as well right yeah if you don't have those ninja skills then uh yeah you're you're afraid of getting into a fight so that's that's what we're practicing here here we're practicing our spiritual ninja skills right here but jim wilson talks about this in another one of his books i think that we all have we all have the word of god so it doesn't really matter what people think about the Bible. The word of God is powerful and it, it cuts into people's souls 
and it um, it will penetrate their defenses. And so we we all have this, you know, we all have this massive uh, weapon in our hands. So I'm just afraid. I don't. Well, just use the Bible. Um, God promises that He will bless bless His word when it's used. So uh, let's keep going here, and let's talk about um, decisive points. So when when we're thinking as far as strategy. So we want to think wisely here, right? Jesus said, be as wise as serpents as, and as gentle as doves. Um, and so we want to be wise in how we go about evangelism. So on page 21, uh, Jim Wilson talks about the, the decisive point. He says, we need to know what a decisive point is, and we need to focus our offensive on the decisive point. He's actually, he quotes from uh, another military philosopher. Uh, looks like, I'm not actually sure who that is. Jomini. Jomini. Anyway, it's another book of military philosophy. It says that in every battlefield, there is a decisive point. And if you can capture the decisive point, it helps to secure the victory and you can apply the principles of war. So you need to find the, the decisive point and strike at the decisive point. So when we think about where should we focus our efforts in evangelism, um, this question of the decisive point is really important. He says there are two ways to help you know what the decisive point is. First, this is on page 21, is the relative importance of that point compared to the rest of the battle. The second is the feasibility of taking that point. Okay, so let's think about this in terms of, of cities. But first, we'll hear from Joy. Yes, Joy. Yeah, and that, that sort of thing is like why he moved to Moscow, because Moscow is a, it doesn't wait, but it's small enough to be feasibly taken. There you go. You, you took the words right out of my mouth. Great minds think alike. Yeah. Well, let's think about, let's back up a little bit. Let's say we all want to, um, let's pick a place, let's go, and let's, 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 focus our evangelism LA let's all move to LA is LA important is LA a center of culture and th does LA have a huge influence on our on the world yeah it does let's, let's go take Hollywood for Jesus no more dumb Christian movies let's make good Christian movies right but is it feasible is it feasible is it realistic? Of course, God can do anything, right? But, um, or think of New York. If you think about what are the two most important cities in our country, probably LA and New York. So let's go to New York. Let's, let's take New York. Now, I, I respect the Christians who are involved in New York. And you know, I, I have some friends who are involved there. And God bless them. It's really important to do that. Um, but yeah, it's just, <laughs> it's, 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 that's a long, 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 long process. So yeah, th so yeah, this is why Jim Wilson moved to the tiny town of Moscow, Idaho. If you look at the map of the world, or just even the Northwest, Moscow is this little tiny blip in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's actually hard to get here. So, I mean, it's, it's a small little town, only, only like 20,000 people. However, Jim Wilson realized, oh, there's a university here. There's the University of Idaho. Yes, we have a university, guys. Come on. It's, we, we're not just potato farmers out here. We I think we have two of them, actually. There's one down in Boise. Two colleges. Yeah. Um, but then over here, if you go across the border, 
you can go to Pullman and there's Washington State University. So Jim Wilson realized college students, college students are a, um, are a, a, a great missionary um, opportunity. They're, they're searching for meaning, they're searching for um, life. Um, you know, what's the purpose of life? And so, yeah, Jim Wilson moved to Moscow, set up his ministry here and has had a huge impact on, uh, again, thousands and thousands of students and other people. Um, of course, this, this school right now, we're, we're having this conversation right now because of Jim Wilson. Uh, well, his son, Doug Wilson, started Logos School and then Logos Online grew out of Logos Brick and Mortar. And um, so, yeah, that's just the downstream effects of this ministry growing and um, uh, expanding all over the all over the world, really. Uh, this is Jim Wilson's ministry. Uh, like I said, he passed away um, about six months ago within the last year. Um, but his ministry is called Community Christian Ministries. And their main focus was um, setting up, was starting um, Christian bookstores all over the U.S. I'm not sure if it's international or not, but their ma main ministry was through Christian literature and booklets, things like that. So they actually had a bookstore down in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm not sure if they still do or not, but they had good Christian books there. And so my parents in the 70s, back in the, you know, the end of the hippie era, they were looking for good Christian books. And so they, they found this, um, this Christian bookstore where they sold, you know, C.S. Lewis and other good Christian books like that. And uh, they had an old magazine put out by Doug Wilson and um, what is now Christ Church. And so this magazine had an ad for this new college that was starting, New St. Andrews College. And I found out about it and went, went, went there and met my wife there. And anyway, here we all are. Uh, but all, all, all goes back to starting a, a, a Christian bookstore. So you never know. The point is, guys, you never know what effect you're going to have. So if, if you give somebody a book, if you send them a link to a YouTube video, a good YouTube video, um, if you give somebody resources, you never know what effect you're going to have. So just to encourage you. So what do you all think about, um, have you thought about this in your own town? Um, or your own community. Think about it. Where are the strategic points, the decisive points in your own state or in your own town or your own community? And maybe think about how you could work together with other people in your communities to reach those decisive points. Now, Jim says that we can we can go all over the world in our um, so how can we affect other places in the world through our um, what's well, not quite evangelism? He says there are two things there uh, there 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 are two ways that we carry out this offensive in the spiritual war. So again, thinking back in terms of spiritual battle, what are our two main weapons in spiritual warfare? Yes, prayer is one. Prayer and, yes, Kimberly. What's, oh. <laughs> this is on page, page 22. Sophia, yeah. I haven't checked, but isn't it evangelism? I think yeah um he calls it something a little bit different but basically uh yeah monica if i remember correctly i think he said prayer and preaching yeah preaching preaching and prayer now we can't all go to africa 
actually, ironically, there's more Christians in Africa now than in the U.S. So it's kind of an outdated. Um, we can't all go to New York <laughs> um, or North Korea, um, but we can pray. We can pray for North Korea. We can pray for New York. And so through prayer, that is spiritual, you know, bombardment. We can send spiritual spiritual um, air attacks. He, he compared it to um, <laughs> six weeks of air bombardment, concentrated prayer. So he says, before you go into an area, pray, 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 pray. So that's like, you know, sending in aircraft to bomb before you send in the army. So prayer, yeah. God promises to bless prayer. He tells us to pray. And that's something we all need to do more. There are, so, there are also some wonderful ministries doing um, great work. I want to just highlight one of them. What I like to do in this class is give you guys some examples of ministries that are doing great work in evangelism. And uh, this one in particular, uh, we used to live in the same town. This is actually based in North Carolina. And a lot of their staff is actually, you know, like uh, grandparent age. And so they're all retiring and they need, they need new, fresh, fresh talent. And so it's called Trans World Radio. And so they broadcast Christian radio all over the world. And so they, they have media. Basically, they're a Christian media um, organization. And so they need, they need video creators. They need content creators. Um, they need people to go maintain these huge radio towers um, all over the world. So if you want to, go, if you're not afraid of heights, I would hate that. But they need people to go climb up the tall radio towers and, you know, maintain them. And so yeah, they're they're broadcasting the gospel into places like North Korea, where the gospel is, where where, where Christians are not allowed to go. So, um, it's a wonderful wonderful ministry, and so yeah. They need content creators. You can even maybe even volunteer with, with this group. I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I know that lots of these groups have lots of, lots of ways that you can get involved. Yeah. So anyway, that's a, another example of, of sending out the gospel through every means possible. And it's so, it's so funny when I was in Africa, um, they don't have reliable, they don't have reliable electricity. So we had a generator um, and the only way we had power was if the generator was working, but everybody has an iPhone. Um, and so they, they buy minutes through, I'm not quite sure how it works, but anyway, so People without running water and reliable electricity have iPhones. And so I would get questions in, in, in the class I taught in Africa. They would ask me, so I saw this YouTube video where this guy was saying this. It's like, so the power of the internet, we need to use the power of the internet in a good way because people are, are exposed to it. And so it's not a question of whether they're going to have access to it. It's a question of, are we putting out good content um, to reach as many people as possible? All right, concentration. We're almost out of time. Six minutes left. Concentration. All right, we've all, you've all seen Top Gun or, top, you know, the new Top Gun, right? So you know that you need a wingman, right? You need, you can't just take on all the communists by yourself. <laughs> Isn't it funny, by the way, in all those movies, the bad guys always have those dark helmets so you can't see if they're people or not. They're not really people. They're bad guys who deserve to die. They're just nameless bad guys. 
But anyway, we all need a wingman. We all need a wingman, right? So this was interesting. Did you notice in the Bible, he pointed out how even the Apostle Paul needed a wingman. So who are some of the wingmen for the Apostle Paul? So on page 30, page 31. Yeah, Titus, Silas, Timothy. Yeah. Um, and he, he, he pointed out that when Paul was in Athens by himself, he didn't have as much of an effect. Oh, I'm sorry if you have different page numbers. That is unfortunate. But when Paul had his wingmen, he was much more effective in his ministry. So there's a phrase. I think it's a good one. In the Christian life, lone rangers are dead rangers. Lone rangers are dead rangers. You can't go out and be a spiritual Batman. Okay? Even Batman needs Robin. He, he may not admit it, but Batman does need Robin. We, we, ought, we need to work together. Don't try and go do this on your own, guys. Don't try and, you know, just be an evangelist by yourself. Um, have someone else. And I like, his, um, I, I like his recommendations on page 32. Um, if you don't have a partner, someone, if you don't have a wingman to help you with evangelism, Pray to God to send you someone. Um, work together, study together, pray together, talk together, encourage one another. Um, so yeah, if, if you don't have a friend like that, pray for one. And um, th this is one area where the Mormon church is doing a lot better than a conservative Christian church, right? You've all seen the Mormons, Elder Bob and Elder Elder Sam riding around on their bicycles, right? They're, they're going out together. They're wingmen. Um, and they're out there evangelizing, spreading the false gospel of Mormonism. So maybe we should learn from the Mormons in, in copying their strategy. <laughs> Do not quote me out of context. Learn from their strategy, not their false gospel. <laughs> oh, goodness. But yeah, no, they, they have a very good system. They expect young people to go out and spend a year when they're really developing their faith. Go spend a year talking to people about Mormonism. Yeah, yeah. So, um, it works. It's a very effective system. So, yes, we need to up our game. That's a good question, Jaden. I don't know why we don't do that. Probably because we don't want to copy something they're doing, even though it might be a good, a good strategy. But yeah, maybe, maybe you all can help start something like that. Just don't have those silly outfits, you know, have a better uniform. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, well, we'll we'll talk more about that. Um, because despite all their problems, the Mormon Church is very well organized. They are they are set up to survive and to take over. They have a strategy. They have a strategy, and they, yeah. We can learn from some of those strategies. So please finish the book. Um, we won't talk about it next week. So really, you guys can just finish this uh, over, over the break if you want. I know you all have a lot of studying to do and exams to focus on. So if you all promise to just finish this by January next semester, that'll be fine. All right. Well, great job, everybody. Good job participating. Uh, we'll see you on Monday to work on those projects. All right. See you later.